A few weeks ago, uh, I taught a three-part series called Adding to Your Faith. How, how many were there for, uh, for those three uh, sessions? And what we did in that series, we looked at what Peter said about adding to your faith. And let's go ahead and put that verse on the screen, what Peter was saying. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, he said, Having all diligence, giving all diligence add to your faith. So in other words, adding to your faith requires diligence. It doesn't happen by accident. Amen. It happens by applying yourself towards your faith. And how do we add to our faith? Well, that verse basically says you add to your faith by adding virtue. How do you add to your virtue? By adding knowledge. How do you add to your knowledge? By adding self-control. How do you add to your self-control? By adding patience. How do you add to your patience? By adding godliness. How do you add to your godliness? By adding brotherly kindness. And how do we add to our brotherly kindness? By adding unconditional love. So we took three weeks to go through that entire process of just those three verses there of adding to our faith. Again, it's not something that happens by accident. Growing in your faith happens by diligently uh, digging into the process of how your faith is, uh, uh, is, how your faith grows, how your faith is added to, how your faith is strengthened. Faith is like a muscle. I believe uh, Eric talked about that on Sunday. If, if you don't use it, you lose it. If you, if you don't use it, it atrophies. So uh, what we're, what we're going to do tonight, we're kind of going to go from a different perspective. Uh, those three sessions were called Adding to Your Faith, Tonight's message is entitled, Subtracting from Your Faith. And, and somebody already asked me tonight, are you really talking about subtracting from your faith? Uh, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the things that can decrease the effectiveness of your faith. I mean, it, it's, it's good to know how to add to your faith, but it's also good to know the things that can interfere with your faith working the way it's supposed to work. Amen? So, I told you last week... Uh, last week's session was kind of a history lesson because it was uh, Fourth of July week. But I told you last week that belief is the primary catalyst for achieving the impossible. All things are possible to him who believes. believes. Right. So my primary job as a preacher and teacher of the Word of God is to get people to believe. Right? With, without belief, you're not going to achieve the impossible. So I got to show you how to believe. And one of the biggest hindrances to belief is lack of results. Well, Pastor Heath, I prayed, and God didn't answer my prayer. I sowed my seed, and I haven't seen my harvest. I'm believing God for a healing, and the healing hasn't manifested. Those kinds of things can hinder belief. So with that in mind, my job is not only to tell you what the Word of God says about your situation— and to tell you what you should believe. But my job is also to tell you how to properly implement the word of God. And tell you the things that can hinder the word of God from working properly in your life. And as I told you last week, there's a way that the kingdom of God works. God's kingdom operates on kingdom law. Every, every uh, blessing that we receive in the kingdom happens because of kingdom justice. Kingdom law, the, the kingdom works a certain way. And if you're not operating according to God's kingdom principles, then the blessings and benefits of kingdom citizenship are not going to be flowing properly in your life. Now, it's, it's not God's fault because his word spells out how his kingdom works. Amen? So with all of that in mind, I'm going to share with you some of the things that can hinder your faith from working the way God designed your faith to work. First thing I want to say is this, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. A true faith is always a producing faith. And faith said amen. She, she's a producing faith. <laughs> a true faith is always a producing faith. So if your faith isn't producing what you think it should be producing, then you just need to find out why it's not producing. Because if you find out why it's not producing, then you can fix it. Does that sound reasonable? If there's a disconnect between heaven and earth, the disconnect is not on God's part. 
So we need to find out why it's not producing. So uh, what I want to say here is that if your faith doesn't line up with the definition of what faith actually is, it's not going to be a producing faith. You know, a lot of people think that they're in faith, but they're not in faith. They're in hope. Or they might be in some sort of mental assent, but they're not actually in faith. They're not actually believing. Now, Anna, don't put this uh, definition on the screen just yet. I have a question for all of the non-former faith lifers, okay? You know, we, we merged our two churches a couple, of months, uh, a couple of months ago, but the former faith lifers have heard me say this definition about 783 times over the past five and, five and a half years. So can anyone tell me, because I've mentioned this definition a few times over the past week, I just want to see if anybody remembers. Can anybody tell me the definition that I like to use for faith? Does anybody remember? I see that that's good that, that people don't remember because that means I, I can embrace a teaching moment. So that, that's fine, okay? But the faith lifers, I'm sure you guys remember. What is faith? Fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God and his word. Let's go ahead and put it up on the, uh, on the screen. Faith is a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God and his word. I want everybody to say that with me. Ready? Faith is a fully persuaded, single-minded, tenacious agreement with God and his word. So the first characteristic that can subtract from your faith is if your faith doesn't match this definition. For example, if your faith is not fully persuaded. The Bible says that Abraham was fully persuaded that God was able to do what he said he would do. Now, that's not a, that's not a light statement. That's not a small statement. God had told Abraham and Sarah that they were going to have a child. They were in their 90s. They were past childbearing age. They had tried to have children all of their lives. They, they were never able to conceive. Sarah had been barren. So it's, it's no small thing that Abraham was fully persuaded that God was going to give them a child despite the circumstances that they were facing. Amen? Faith is fully persuaded. Faith cannot be, you can't convince me that it doesn't work. Right? That's fully persuaded. Amen. I, I remember uh, a, a, a testimony that I gave many times uh, regarding a situation that Louise and I were facing, and I won't go into it tonight because it takes too long. But after we faced that situation, Louise said to me, in the, in the weeks moving up to that situation, it was as though it had already happened, and I was just waiting for time to catch up with me. That's how much faith she had. In her mind, it was already done. She was just waiting for time to catch up. That's fully persuaded. So faith is fully persuaded. If your faith is not single-minded, that can subtract from your faith. Why? Because the Bible says in James that a double-minded man should expect to receive nothing from the Lord. Now, the Bible does not say that God doesn't offer anything to the double-minded man. It just says that he shouldn't expect to receive it. It doesn't mean that God isn't offering it. God's grace is always offered to us. You know, the Bible says, by grace, you are saved through faith. God's grace offers it. Our faith receives it. Faith is a receiver. Everybody say, faith is a receiver. And I just, I don't mean just the lady sitting on the front row. <laughs> say, I am a receiver. <laughs> Amen. So uh, a double-minded man should expect to receive nothing from the Lord. Why? Because he can't make up his mind what he wants. He's double-minded. He's wishy-washy. He believes God today. He doesn't believe God tomorrow. He believes God when everything's going okay, but when everything starts falling apart, he loses his, uh, his faith. He loses his single-mindedness. And then that ties into tenacity. If your faith is not tenacious, the Bible says hold fast to your profession of faith. Why do you have to hold fast? Because there's going to be occasions in your lifetime when you're going to be tempted to let go. 
there will be challenges that we face in life. You're going to be tempted to let go of your faith. Hold fast to it. Hold tightly to it, to your profession of faith. The Bible says in due season, you will reap if you don't faint. That word faint, it means to let go. If you don't let go, if you don't quit, if you don't give up. Pastor Andre, a few weeks ago, he was talking about the persistence of faith. And I believe uh, Sherry quoted it tonight. She said, having done all, you stand, right? Faith is persistent. You stand. How long do you stand until the answer shows up? How long do you stand until the, until the prayer is answered? How long do you stand until you have the manifestation? You don't ask how long you got to stand. You just stand. Amen. Faith is persistent. Faith is tenacious. It doesn't quit. And then lastly, faith is in full agreement with God and his word. Faith has to be in agreement with God. It has to be in agreement with what God's word says. And I'm going to take it a step further. Faith doesn't just agree that you want what the word says. Faith agrees that what the word says is yours. Do you see the difference there? There's a difference between saying, yes, I agree, I want that, and saying, yes, I agree, this is mine, because God's word says it's mine. You see the difference? So faith is in full agreement with God and his word. Now, some people might ask, well, why do you say faith is uh, agreement with God and his word? Doesn't the Bible say that God and his word are one and the same? Somebody get your phone. <laughs> why do we say God and his word? Aren't God and his word one and the same? Because the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So why did I say that faith is tenacious agreement with God and his word. Well, the reason, I, the reason that I uh, uh, wrote it that way is that some people can recite the word, but that doesn't mean they know the God of the word. Some people think that they have faith because they know what the word says, but just because you know what it says doesn't mean that you believe it. And just because you can quote the word doesn't mean that you know God's character. It doesn't mean that you know who God is. You know, this uh, last week, we were running the call center while we had Revival X going on. And Re Revival X was being broadcast on the television networks 24-7. And so what they did was South Africa was running the call center for 16 hours a day, and then we, here in the U.S., we were running the call center for eight hours a day while South Africa was asleep, okay? And so I came in the other day to answer the phones, and there was a guy on the phone who was just absolutely belligerent with me. He said, man, I don't agree with anything you guys are saying on the network, all this stuff. He said, I, I, I don't agree with uh, what Paul said and this, and he, he starts quoting Paul, and this is not the first person that I've ever met who didn't believe in the writings of Paul. There are, there are a lot of so-called Christians out there who don't believe that Paul's writings were scriptural. And this guy was one of them. And so he's saying, you know, there a lot of things that Paul said contradict what Jesus said and all this kind of stuff. And I told him, I said, sir, you need to understand the purpose of this phone line is not for us to debate doctrine. That's, that's not what this phone line is for. This phone line is for me to be able to pray with people. And the longer I talk with you about this, the more it's tying up the line, and I, I'm, not, I'm not able to pray with people. That's what this phone line is for. And he said, well, you know, uh, this could be the most important phone call you ever receive. He said, you need to hear what I have to say, because it's more important than somebody who calls you and says, pray for my hip. <laughs> And so I, th this guy was getting really belligerent. And finally, you know, I, I said, sir, I've told you several times, this phone line is not for uh, debating doctrine. If you don't want to pray, that's, that's fine. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the, the phone call. And I hung up. That guy ended up calling back for the next 30 minutes, just calling over and over and over again for the next 30 minutes. That was a person who could quote the word, 
but he didn't know the God of the word. He didn't know the character of God, okay? So when it comes to understanding the character of God, I want everyone to write this down. Here's a rule of thumb when it comes to trying to interpret scripture. As a general rule, the most correct interpretation of scripture is the interpretation that paints God's character in the best light. All right? When you're reading the word of God, when you are trying to figure out, okay, what happened in this story? What happened in in this situation? As a general rule, the best interpretation is the interpretation that's going to give God the most praise. That's going to, to recognize God's character in the best light. If you think that God is a hard taskmaster, if you think that God is sitting on the edge of his throne waiting to throw lightning bolts at you, if you think that God is a loose cannon who kills babies so that he can plant another flower in his heavenly garden, if you think that God is angry with you, if you think that God told Paul no when Paul asked God to remove the thorn in the flesh, If you think any of those things, you don't understand God's character. And there are a lot of Christians who believe those kinds of things. They don't understand God's character. The more I've studied God's word, the deeper that I've dug into his word, the more I realize, number one, how good he is. But also, the more I realize that his word never, ever, ever contradicts itself. Even when I thought, When I would read something and I go, well, that seems to contradict this. Then you study it and you dig into it and you go into the original language and you find out, wow, not only does it not contradict that, it actually supports it even more. That's that's how good and how, how consistent God's word is. Paul never contradicted Jesus, ever. I know a lot of people think that he did, but he didn't. So I want to change gears here for a second. And and again, we're talking about the things that can subtract from your faith. There is an idea that a lot of people have talked about in the body of Christ. The Bible talks about this, about the danger of us allowing our freedom in Christ and our liberty in Christ to cause our brother to stumble. How many have read that or heard that or talked about that before? Well, I want to look into that idea tonight, and we're going to spend a little time here. Romans chapter 14, we're going to start in verse 1, and Paul says this, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. See, that's why I don't like vegetables. I'm kidding. Verse three, the one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Let's skip down to verse five. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another person considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Let's skip down to verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. Skip down to verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. 
Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fall. All right? Now, that was Romans. Paul addresses this same subject again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So let's go over there. We're going to start in verse 23. And Paul says this. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. Now let me stop here for a second and explain what he's talking about. In these days, there were a lot of temples that received burnt offerings for false gods, okay? A lot of idol worship and false temples and things like that. And so people who worship false gods, they would go into these temples and they would bring animal sacrifices to be sacrificed to their god. What the temples would do is they would take th these animals and take this meat that had been sacrificed and they would sell it in the meat market. They'd make money from it. Or they'd start little restaurants that people could come and eat, okay? So they were making money on the backside of this, all right? And what happened was sometimes Christians would say, you can't eat that meat. It's been sacrificed to an, to an idol. And of course, Paul understood, I can eat anything because that idol is a false idol. He, he doesn't even exist. He's a figment of somebody's imagination. That meat isn't unclean. But to that person, it is. And so he said, if someone says to you, this meat has been offered in sacrifice, then don't eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of, of conscience. Next verse. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved." So let's start breaking some of this down. Uh, let's put back uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 2. In Romans 14, 2, whose faith is weak in this verse? Is it the person who can eat anything or the person who puts limitations on what they can eat? It's the person who puts limitations. Now, why does it say that their faith is weak? Their faith is weak because this person who puts limitations on what they can eat, they apparently feel that they have to add self-imposed rules to their own Christian lifestyle in order to maintain their right standing with God. You see that? Okay. Did God tell them they can't eat meat? No. Does what you have to eat, does that have anything to do with your right standing with God or with pleasing God? So why couldn't they eat meat? because they felt that their faith alone wasn't enough to get the job done. It's the, work of, it's the work of the cross plus these rules, right? It's my faith in God plus these extra rules. That's, what, that's what's going to put me in right standing with God. You, do, you, do you see the weakness of faith in that kind of thought process? 
So with that in mind, I've come up with a definition that I use for legalism. And you can write this down. Legalism is the act of adding self-imposed rules to your faith. Legalism happens when people think that their faith alone can't achieve right standing with God. And I like to refer to legalism as a faith stealer. Legalism steals your faith. Kind of like Eric did. He stole faith's heart. He's a faith stealer. Well, Pastor Heath, you know, our church doesn't allow ladies to wear jeans. Our church doesn't allow men to wear colored shirts. Our church doesn't allow people to swim in a public swimming pool. What are they doing? They are adding self-imposed rules to their faith because they don't think that their faith in God is good enough. They don't think that the work of the cross is good enough. It's not the work of the cross plus this. It's just the work of the cross, right? I remember years ago, I was uh, asked to visit a church. A friend of mine was a worship leader there, and this was a holiness church. I didn't know a whole lot about holiness churches. And so uh, I went in there. Every single man in the church had to wear a white dress shirt. It could not be a colored dress shirt. It could not be white with stripes. It had to be a white dress shirt. All the ladies were in dresses, sleeves down to the wrist, dresses all the way down to the ankles. And I come into this place wearing a black and white checkered jacket and a red shirt and red and black shoes. I'm sure they thought I, I came from the devil himself. <clears throat> they were all staring at me. But all of these things are forms of legalism. They're self-imposed rules that God never put on them. And it's an example of weak, of weak faith. A few years ago uh, at Faith Life, we did, actually we did this every year, on Super Bowl weekend, I would tell the church, come to church wearing your favorite football jersey. And so the whole praise and worship team, we, we were all wearing football jerseys. I was wearing a football jersey. People in the congregation were wearing fo football jerseys. And Lana Carlton, she came to church, and she had a big old smile on her face. And I go, what are you, what are you smiling about so much? She goes, I just love being free. And I thought, wow, what a sad state of affairs in the church where somebody feels like they've been set free just because they can wear a football jersey to church. <laughs> Amen? Now, an important thing to understand in Paul's scenarios here is that he says we can't allow our liberty in Christ to become a stumbling block to those who are weak in faith. So we need to be mindful that if we're strong in faith and we're talking with somebody who's weak in faith, we don't want to allow our uh, freedom in Christ to become a stumbling block to them. But here's a question then. Is there a point where it stops making sense to make room for the weakness of other people's faith? Or I'll say it this way. What's the point of having liberty in Christ if you can't operate in that liberty? Now, before anybody thinks I'm speaking heresy, <laughs> let, me, let me explain to you where I'm going with this. Several years ago, I decided uh, I, I wanted to do something. I wanted to read the entire NIV Bible cover to cover. Now, when I say read, I, I meant I wanted to read. I didn't want to study. I just wanted to read. Because, you know, when, when you get to studying, man, you, one verse will take you to another verse, and then you're digging into the original Hebrew and the original Greek, and you're conjugating verbs, and you're, I mean, you're really digging, you're doing word studies, and it would have taken forever to get through the NIV Bible if I studied it. I didn't want to study it. I just wanted to read it. But how many have ever dealt with this before? When you read something, you get to the end of the passage that you just read, and you don't remember anything you just read. <laughs> yeah, I've been there many times. So what I found out was if I read it while I'm also listening to it, I retain more. So what I did was I got on BibleGateway.com. I pulled up the NIV Bible. And then uh, BibleGateway.com also has audio Bibles. 
And so I would read it while I was listening to it. And one day I was reading and I got to this passage that we just read in Romans 14. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, shut the audio off. So I shut the audio off. And we were, we were getting into this part in Romans 14 where Paul is talking about a brother who is weak in faith, who can't eat everything because he's weak in faith. And God asked me right in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, do I want people to live with weakness of faith? What's the answer? No. Do I desire people to continue living in ignorance? No. And then he spoke these words to me, and I'm going to put it on the screen. He said, then your responsibility towards your weaker brother must go beyond simply abstaining from the things that would make him stumble. And what, what do you mean by that, Pastor Heath? Well, okay, if I go to dinner with somebody who doesn't eat anything that isn't kosher, you know what kosher is, the, the rules that they had in the Old Testament. You can't eat shellfish. You can't eat catfish. Uh, certain, you can't eat pork. Um, did you know that under kosher rules, you can't have a cheeseburger? Because you can't have cheese and meat at the same time, which is why if you go to Israel and you order a pizza, they don't have meat on pizza over there. They have vegetables and cheese, but they don't have meat because you can't have meat and cheese in the same dish, in the same meal. So if I go to dinner with somebody who doesn't eat anything that isn't kosher because of their weakness of faith, and I eat kosher food, you know, I, I don't order the shrimp, and I don't order a cheeseburger, and we finish the meal, and we go our separate ways, I have not caused a stumbling block for him. But he left the table still weak in faith. Right? Right? So notice Paul says, we should eat anything that our brother puts in front of us, but we should not eat anything that causes our brother to stumble. So this whole passage is about selflessness, right? It's about not allowing your liberty to cause somebody else to stumble. So if it's about selflessness, it's also about ministering to others, even if it is at the expense of our own liberty, so if this passage is about ministering to others, then doesn't it stand to reason that at some point in this process, we have the responsibility to lovingly nurture our weaker brother into a stronger faith, right? We don't want to leave people in ignorance. We don't want to leave people in a place of weakened faith. And see, I've heard these passages preached all my life, and most of the time, people only focus on not causing our brother to stumble, but our responsibility can't stop there because we don't want them to still wallow in ignorance. Amen? Years ago, I was working for a church up in Ohio, and one of our uh, board members of the church there, his wife refused to put up a Christmas tree. And so we asked her one day, you know, how come you never put up a Christmas tree? And she said, well, Christmas trees are pagan. And it is true that Christmas trees originally came from a pagan ritual. I, I, think, it was, I think they're Celtic, I think. Or, or maybe they're from the Druids. I, I don't remember. But they, they, they originally came. They're, they're not Christian, okay? They're not biblical. It's not, they, they don't have biblical roots. They have pagan roots. And she said, I'm not going to put up a Christmas tree because Christmas trees are pagan. Well, Put up Romans 14, 5 again. Paul says, one person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them can, should be convinced in their own mind. In other words, a thing is what you say it is. If you say that this day is holy, then it is holy because you said it's holy. Because you, decide to, you decided to make it holy. Where I might just say, today's Tuesday. Right? It's holy because you said it was holy. Well, in the same way, 
When I look at a Christmas tree, I see the evergreen and I'm reminded of everlasting life. I see the star at the top of the tree and I'm reminded of the star that the Magi followed to find Jesus. I see the twinkling lights on the tree and I'm reminded that Jesus is the light of the world. Okay? That's what it is to me. I don't care what it is to the pagans that invented it. Right? I, I don't care about that. I care about what it is to me. And so our pastor's wife, she sat down with this lady and she explained these things to her. And she's like, look, you don't have to be bound by this legalistic approach towards Christmas trees. God is not going to, you're not going to lose your right standing with God because you put up a Christmas tree. And the lady says, thank you so much for telling me this. I have always wanted to put up a Christmas tree, but I always thought that I shouldn't because it's a pagan thing. She says, no, you've got freedom. Enjoy your freedom in Christ. And so the following Christmas, her house looked like Santa Claus threw up on it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it, there was Christmas trees and decorations all over the place. It was gorgeous. Now, the pastor's wife could have left everything alone and said, well, I don't want to hinder her faith. But instead, she, she chose to explain to that woman what the Word of God says about her faith. Amen? Amen. When I was a kid, somebody, I think it was my mom, but somebody told me, don't ever sit anything on the Bible. You know, don't, don't set anything on, on top of the Bible because the Bible is a holy book and it's, it needs to be treated with reverence. You don't ever set anything on, on top of the Bible. And so when I was growing up, I never set anything on top of the Bible until one day I realized, and now hear my heart, this is just a book, okay? This is paper and leather and glue, and ink. It doesn't have any value until what's in it gets in here. This is just the book. What's in here is valuable because I've applied what's written in this book to my heart. That's what makes it valuable. That's what makes it holy. That's what makes it sacred. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going to sit it out in my driveway and run my car over it. Okay, I still respect the word of God, but you know, I don't, I don't hesitate to set my towel on top of it. Okay, amen. amen. Again, it's just you're adding self imposed rules to your faith. That's what legalism is. Now, legalism can sneak up on you in some of the most seemingly innocent ways. I have noticed that in some sectors of the body of Christ, positive confession has become its own form of legalism. Because people will say, well, you can't say this and you can't say that. You know, I, I remember one day I went up to a lady in church and she was a, a children's pastor. And I said, you know, my kids just love you to death. And you would have thought I cussed at her. You just spoke death on me. No, I didn't speak death on you. I just told you my kids love you. Okay? But she said, no, you should never speak that. Don't ever say you're speaking death on somebody. Well, no, it's not that I'm speaking death. My kids love you till death. <laughs> my kids love you. That's, that's what I was saying. Um, one thing that Pastor Andre says a lot, he'll say, I feel that God wants us to do this. I feel that God wants to do that. I feel that God has taken the service in a certain direction. He'll say, I feel a lot. And the first time I heard him say, I feel something on the inside of me just smiled because there are a lot of people in this movement of the word of faith who don't like it when you say, I feel because we're not led by our feelings. We're led by our spirit. You can't say, I feel and, and actually, I've heard many Christians say that. Don't ever say, I feel. And then <laughs> I asked somebody one day, well, if I'm not supposed to say, I feel, what should I say? Say, I sense. <laughs> well, have you read a thesaurus? <laughs> feel and sense are this, they're, they're synonymous. 
It's just semantics. All right? It's like people are afraid of their words. Right? And fear is still fear. And fear is still the opposite of faith. Now, I realize, don't get me wrong, I realize that we can be snared by the words of our mouth. I do realize death and life are in the power of the tongue. But at the same time, I don't want to turn my speech into a form of legalism. You got to be mindful about that. And that's one of the things that can sneak up on you and it can hinder your faith. Now, this next story I'm going to tell you is one of the craziest encounters with legalism that I have ever experienced in my life. Okay. How many, by a show of hands, I'm going to ask it this way. How many do not know what a hookah is? Do not know what a hookah is. Okay. A hookah, a hookah, H-O-O-K-A-H, is, it's like a, a water pipe that people will smoke tobacco through it. The tobacco gets filtered through the water. Um, you, you might have seen them on television and you never knew what it, what it was, but it, they have a big, long tube and the person will smoke out of the tube. You ever seen those? Okay, that's called a hookah. I think they're Middle Eastern is where they come from. So I went, I, I was a, 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 a contract musician for a church in Alabama a large spirit-filled church, church of about 3,000 people. And one day I went to lunch with the worship pastor. We get done with lunch. We're heading back to the church. And he says, do you know what a hookah is? And at the time I didn't. And he goes, yeah, it's, uh, it's like a water pipe thing and you smoke different flavors of tobacco through it. And he said, uh, what we're all doing, a bunch of us are going over to the associate pastor's house. Now the associate pastor lived right across the street from the church. A bunch of us are going over to the associate pastor's house and we're going to smoke the hookah. Now, th these were leaders in the church. So we, we pull up to the associate pastor's house. I walk into this house and all these people are sitting around the dining room table and the associate pastor is there, the associate pastor's wife, um, the youth pastor, the children's pastor, the worship pastor, uh, the, the, the church accountant, the bookkeeper, um, their wives, their secretaries, all these people are sitting around this room passing this pipe around, smoking the hookah, and talking church, talking church business. I'm telling you, it was the most awkward thing I have ever experienced in my 30-year career in ministry. I'm like, what kind of fresh craziness is this? And so I was the only person in the room who didn't smoke it. They were passing the pipe around, and when it would get to me, I'd pass it on to somebody else. I was there for about 45 minutes, extremely uncomfortable. And I realized after a time, what was going on with this church was they were convinced that, man, when you're free in Christ, you're free in Christ. And you can do anything and everything that you want to do, you're free. And I, I'm telling you, these people smoked, they drank, they, uh, you know, they go over to the associate pastor's house, smoking the hookah, all that kind of stuff. Most, most of the people in leadership smoked cigarettes. I didn't know this at the time. But uh, they, they were really, really big on the freedom that we have in Christ. And I realized what it came down to was they didn't feel that you were completely free unless you demonstrated your freedom by engaging in these kind of activities. In other words, their freedom from legalism became its own form of legalism. You have to do this in order to prove that you're free. It was crazy. And so, like I said, I was the only person who didn't smoke it that day. And I noticed, and Louise noticed this too, after that day, they didn't call me as much for things that they, you know, they used to be, they'd call me all the time. Hey, can you lead worship for this event? Can you play trumpet for this outreach? Can you play organ for this service? Can you uh, sing on the front line? Can you lead worship for this? Help us out with that. I would say the phone calls probably decreased by at least 60% after that day because 
I wasn't as free as they were. You see? It became its own form of legalism. As a pastor, my goal is to get this entire church to live and walk in the liberty that's afforded to us in Christ so that none of us are adding self-imposed rules to our life in order to try to achieve a better right standing with God. Legalism proves that your faith is weak because legalism is adding self-imposed rules. The body of Christ has experienced enough legalism. The body of Christ has experienced enough religiosity. And the body of Christ has experienced enough over-controlling environments. I've seen a lot of that too. The Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If people don't understand that liberty, we certainly don't want our liberty to become a stumbling block to them. But instead of simply abstaining from doing the things that offend them, Instead of always stooping down to their level, how about helping people out of the ditch so that they can walk in a greater, in a greater liberty? Amen? Legalism will steal people's faith. So let's make the effort to combat legalism. Now, you have to do it in love. Amen? You have to do it with patience. You have to be kind. But if people trust you and they trust your motives, they trust your heart, you can make an impact on their lives. I want to show you another thing that can subtract from your faith. Religion. Religion can subtract from your faith. Jesus said this, Mark chapter 7. He said, you make the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which you have handed down. Religious traditions have the capacity to make the word of God of no effect. Now, I want you to think about how profound that statement is. God created the entire universe with his word. He spoke the word. He spoke the universe into, into existence. He said, let there be light. And light was. The word of God builds our faith. Right? Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Faith ultimately comes by the word of God. The Bible says that the word of God will never return void but it will accomplish what it set out to accomplish. The holy, infallible word of the almighty creator of the universe is a powerful, supernatural word. And yet Jesus said, religious traditions can make it of no effect. That should tell you something about the power of religious traditions. When you do something godly, purely out of religious tradition, you're robbing yourself of the profound supernatural impact that it can bring to your life. This is one of the reasons that I spoke about praise on Sunday morning. You know, Christians get so accustomed to church as usual. Praise and worship can become a religious tradition rather than a supernatural encounter with an almighty God. Because we go through the same motions and do the same things service after service. That's why I encourage the whole church at the end of service last week, or this past Sunday, I said, next Sunday, I challenge you, do something you've never done before. Because I know from the word of God and from personal experience, in order to accomplish something you've never accomplished before, you got to do something you've never done before. Amen. I know from experience that the more you step out of your comfort zone, the greater you will experience the tangibility of God's presence in your praise and worship. It's happened to me many, many, many times. And I'm just trying to get the whole church to step into something greater. Amen? The vision for 2024 for this church was 2024 was the year of more and more and more. Well, you're never going to experience more tomorrow than what you had yesterday if you're still doing the same things tomorrow that you did yesterday, right? In order to get something you never had, you got to do something you never done. Faith is action. Faith has movement. Faith does something. Amen? James chapter 2 verse 17 says that faith, if it doesn't have any works, it's dead. Faith without works is dead. Faith does not hesitate to act on what it believes. Why? Because faith is fully persuaded, it's single-minded, it's tenacious, and it is in full agreement with God, with God and his word. 
you know, a, full, uh, a few people came up to me on Sunday after service, and they said, you know, I almost got out of my seat today to praise and worship God. Because remember when I said, get out of your seat? I know Billy did, <laughs> running up and down the altar. In 30 years of ministry, I cannot tell you how many times people have almost acted and didn't. Well, I almost came forward for prayer, but I didn't. I almost tithed, but I didn't. I almost lifted my hands in worship, but I didn't. I almost asked that girl out, but I didn't. I almost called about that job opportunity, but I didn't. One of the most important aspects about acting on your faith is that when you feel that you should act, you need to act immediately. Act on your faith immediately before your mind, your will, and your emotions have a chance to talk you out of it. Faith is action. Say that. Faith is action. And that brings me to the last thing that I want to share regarding the things that can subtract from your faith. People always talk about the importance of faith-filled words. We talk about death and life are in the power of the tongue. We're snared by the words of our mouth. We need to hold fast to our profession of faith. I've, I've already talked about these tonight. And here's a scripture that we often quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul is quoting David, and he says, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. Well, there it is, Pastor Heath. If you believe, you're going to speak. Faith speaks. Well, actually, this doesn't say that faith speaks. It says the spirit of faith speaks. You see that? We have the same spirit of faith. I remember years ago, uh, somebody had gone, I don't remember who this was, but somebody had gone to a conference, and it was a conference that was um, celebrating Martin Luther King. And they had all these speeches and all these people that were talking about uh, unity and talking about uh, living in peace with our brothers and sisters and uh, bringing down racial barriers and everything. And this person said, the spirit of Martin Luther King was there. Now, when they said this, they didn't mean the ghost of Martin Luther King showed up in the room. That's not what they meant. What they were saying was the same essence of who he was, the same the same desire for peace, the same desire for unity, the same values that he embraced were in the building. But, the, the, but that, that was the way they said it. The spirit of Martin Luther King was there. The essence of who he was. The essence of faith speaks. But if all your faith is doing is speaking, it's not going to produce much. Because faith doesn't just speak, faith acts. Faith acts because talk is cheap. Anybody can talk, but not everybody can act. Here's what James has to say about talk being cheap. James chapter 2, and we were already in this chapter earlier tonight, but I'm going to read a little bit more. Starting in verse 14, James says, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the, demon, even the demons believe and tremble. And some, some Christians don't even tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works, faith was made perfect? So faith is more than words. Faith is the works that are the evidence of what you believe. 
Now, we're not, we don't achieve right standing with God through works. We're not trying to work for our salvation. What I'm saying is faith is the evidence. I'm sorry, works are the evidence that you have faith. If you have faith, you're going to act. You had faith tonight that this chair would support you, so you sat down on it. If you didn't have faith in the chair, you wouldn't have plopped down on it. All right? We're not earning right standing with God through works, but works are the evidence that we have faith. So here's my conclusion. I'm going to sum up tonight's teaching. There's a handful of things that can subtract from your faith, things that you want to be mindful of when you're operating in faith. Number one is this, lack of belief will subtract from your faith. Lack of results can contribute to lack of belief, but lack of results typically comes from misunderstanding and misapplying God's word and God's kingdom principles. Learn how the kingdom works. What did Jesus say? Seek first the kingdom. Learn how his government works. Learn how his principles operate. Put them into, into operation in your life, and when you do, everything you need will be added unto you. Why? Because you're, you're operating in kingdom principles. Another thing that will subtract from your faith, not being fully persuaded, not being single-minded, not being tenacious, and not being in full agreement with God's word can subtract from your faith. Again, not lining up with the definition of what faith is. Some people think they're in faith when they're actually not. They're actually in some sort of hope or some sort of mental assent. Not understanding God's character can subtract from your faith. And as I told you earlier tonight, choose the interpretation that paints God's character in the best light. That's going to be the most accurate way to, uh, uh, to interpret any passage in the Bible. God is not a hard taskmaster. God is not mad at you. Amen? Legalism will subtract from your faith. Because if you're engaged in legalism, it means you're adding self-imposed rules because you don't think that your faith is enough. Your faith is enough. Everybody say, my faith is enough. Faith is enough. Amen. By grace, you're saved but through faith. Not faith and something else. Faith. Religious tradition will subtract from your faith. Why? Because religious tradition makes everything stale. Everything is by rote. Everything is because this is the way we've always done it. It's not by relationship. Religion, relationship is what is the ultimate goal that God wants with you anyway. He wants a relationship with you. And then lastly, speaking faith without acting on faith will subtract from your faith. Why? Because talk is cheap. Action is the proof of what you believe not mere words. Now, faith won't hesitate to speak, but true faith talks and acts. Amen? You learn anything tonight? Good.